Hello, you crazy, amazing humans, and welcome to the Crazy Amazing Human podcast, where we highlight everyday humans doing crazy, amazing things, people just like you and me who use their talents and resources to give back, pay it forward, and make a difference. I'm Katrina Carlson. And I'm Jefferson Denham. And we want to start off by saying uh, thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are, whether you are listening to us with headphones while taking a walk, watching us on YouTube, on your computer at home, or driving in your car. It just feels good to be together, right? It Kat? does, definitely. And so we believe it is more important than ever to stay connected. So head over to our website at crazyamazinghumans.com to make sure that you are subscribed to our newsletter so that we can always be in communication with you. Absolutely. And that way, you can also access resources and content that we've put together for you mm -hmm. to help you in your life journey. Right. We definitely want to be here for you in any way we can and create a community. And so we'd love to re remind you to subscribe to our podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And since we also film many of these episodes, please don't forget to subscribe to the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. It gives Jefferson a reason to put on pants. Ha, ha, ha. Well, I definitely <laughs> shaved, yes, and put on pants. Thank you okay, for noticing <laughs> because I didn't want to scare our guest. Yes. We are so excited to be in conversation today with our guest, Roger Fishman. Roger was a successful businessman and then an entrepreneur, and then he made, as he calls it, a quote unquote life 180. He is now an adventurer, a filmmaker, a photographer, and philanthropist. His life trajectory is fascinating yes. right and his mm -hmm. story is one you will not want to miss yeah for sure and we want to make sure we're always giving you the most uplifting and inspiring stories and practical information so we're on a mission to inspire you and remind you that you, you are, are crazy, crazy amazing. amazing i want you to feel i want you to feel something crazy crazy Swimming with bears, hanging with penguins, nature and wildlife photographer Roger Fishman spans the globe with his camera. But when he's not on an adventure, he's volunteering at Cedar sinai Medical Center, sharing his travels with patients. Wherever you want to go in the world, we can go. It's something that means a lot uh, to me to take my photography and my art and to share it, and also to hopefully entertain and distract people and patients who are you know, in the hospital for a while. Roger's been volunteering for several years now, visiting folks like Tracy Whitaker. She's battling cancer for the second time, back on chemotherapy with a fighting spirit. Absolutely, I plan on beating it. And Roger plans on helping by giving her positive energy even more of a boost. Because this was minus 40 degrees. Yes, today Tracy's going on an Ice Age adventure, the Arctic Circle, Antarctica, and more. I like polar bears, I like, uh, polar bears, penguins. I think it's a chance for people to travel the world, even when they're in the hospital. And all you can see is ice and snow, and it's just this beautiful landscape. I think it's wonderful. It kind of takes you out of the, the, the moment of the, the chemo and so forth, and it, it gives you something, you know, else to, to kind of focus on and look forward to. Now Roger and Tracy will meet again. They'll talk about the world, life, and experience places most have never seen. Tracy says along with family and her medical team, this angel of a traveler is just what the doctor ordered. If you care and you act on it, then you make a difference. It's actually pretty simple amazing words in that video and he is definitely making a difference and in light of the quarantine more than ever this idea of virtually traveling through photography is really relevant today so you can see why we're really excited to introduce you to today's guest Roger Fishman we are here in the studio practicing physical distancing but we are able to see each other which is really nice and um, so just to let you know a little bit about Roger, he grew up in the small town of Orange, Connecticut. 
Now he lives in Los Angeles and has created his own consulting video production social media marketing business. And after the birth of his son, he embarked on a journey he calls Life 180, which has resulted in, amongst other things, his dedication of time and energy to helping others through volunteering, pro bono wildlife work, and speaking engagements. With a huge exclamation point, Roger is an adventurer, an artist, a photographer, a filmmaker, and clearly an underachiever. And Roger Fishman, welcome to Crazy Amazing Humans. Thank you for having me. We are so glad to have you here, Roger. Although you could have put on long pants, I'm just saying. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> we like that. You've got very no. nice legs. Well, well, where to begin with you, my friend? Uh, okay, let me start with something that we were intrigued to read from your website. Uh, in life, we are often driven by our past, both by the known and unknown forces that shaped our lives. These forces drive us. Well. Uh, Katrina and I are big believers in the idea that, you know, where we come from and uh, what we go through early in life gives us empathy and insights and passion for causes that we want to embrace and champion as adults. And I think that's true for you. So how has your early life, your early family life and circumstances influenced your endeavors now? That's a great question. Thanks. Thanks for having me, of course. Appreciate it. Now, when I grew up, my parents uh, were both very, very creative people and very interested and interesting. Uh, and you know, my father died uh, at the age of 46 when I was 13. My mother is still alive at the age of 91. But I think that their inherent DNA, which obviously was passed along to me, uh, is part of how and who I am. I think the other piece is, you know, I grew up in a broken household and it ended up being that we were also poor. My parents had a very bad divorce. Um, my mother, at one point in time, I was with her at Sears, I remember, and she went to buy something after the divorce, or about the same time, and she gave the lady the charge card. And the lady went to charge it and came back and said, I'm sorry, it's denied. And my mother didn't know why, but it was my father had stopped payment on the credit card. And so that became a whole spiral, and he was not... He was a general practitioner doctor, but he really was not interested per se in medicine and making money. He was, again, much more sort of open and exploring the world. And it ended up that we just had no money. My mother had to uh, become a dental hygienist, work six days a week, $2 an hour, constantly scrambling amongst different dentists. And all that led to a point where I was on food stamps for a little bit in elementary school. So the reason I, I give you that context and is that one of my key drivers that was both a motivator, but at the same time also held me back, was I wanted to make sure I was never like in that position again, where we couldn't afford our groceries, where we couldn't afford you know, lunch for me at school. So for me, having uh, financial freedom was really important, psychologically, emotionally, and practically. And what I realized is that was both a motivator, but it also kept me on a path that uh, kept reinforcing that, which is, you know, bigger jobs, bigger uh, sort of compensation, more opportunity, more risk all the time. But I knew that I needed to take care of my mother at some point. I knew that I wanted to have a family and take care of my family. And I also knew that I would have friends and also just, you know, people I wanted to help out, organizations to help out over time. So as I went through that, that kept being my driver. And then our son was born, and I really thought about what do I want his life to be? And I wanted him to pursue what was true to him. So once I had some freedom to lift my head up and think about what do I want for my son and what are the principles I'm teaching him, I had to say, well, how am I applying those to myself? And am I asking him to be true to himself but not holding myself to the same standard? So it took a lot of emotional uh, study of myself to say, can I let go of that fear? Of, of being broke and being poor uh, and not providing. I knew that I could practically, but then was I worth it, right? Because when you let go of that, your past, it's a driver for so long, that's who you are, right? My jobs, my titles, you know, what I was, what I was doing. When you let go of that, uh, you have to say, well, what is it you really want to be? And I always knew it but it was honestly scary to go get there. Uh, 
So, you know, I always wanted to have my own business, so I did that, and that fortunately worked out. I also always wanted to be creative, but when I grew up, I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't even know that was a possibility. You know, I, I thought, honestly, and I was gonna do a lot of different jobs, but there were none gonna be like that, because I, I wasn't exposed to it. So I had to get myself to believing that I was worth it. That's great. That's great. And so, you know, should we unpack your life 180? And I think you're alluding to that in what you're just talking about. And um, you stated before that the more you wonder about things, the more wisdom you get. And I'm guessing that means you're an advocate for always growing and learning, which is what we like to do. And uh, you have achieved success, as you said, and then you shifted away from your corporate America kind of uh, career. So... I guess that birth of your son was a catalyst. You want to talk about the life 180? Yeah, to me, you know, we, we, I always feel like there's different uh, rules that were taught growing up. I can only speak as you know, one human being, one man in my situation. But mm -hmm. you know, we're taught to be uh, the mountain and the master, right? To look, to seek and create control, uh, to always achieve more and be ambitious. But no one ever says, well. Why? <laughs> what, and what does that really mean? Like We don't really go underneath it. We just go strong, right? You know, because that's what's been portrayed. Yeah. And that is obviously historical to true, right? When you go back to the cavemen and beyond, you know, you needed people who are hunters and gatherers. But we have evolved for better and for worse. And so to me, it was really a question of, you know, how did I want to evolve? Really, and really what was the most... True, because I look at things, you know, we have this blink of an eye to be alive on this planet. Mm -hmm. At best a blink, you know, the planet's 4.5 billion years. The universe is 14 billion years. And that's all best guesses, right? Uh -huh. uh, I just know that if I'm lucky, I get another 20, 25, and probably half of those left are gonna be healthy ones, like where I can really be vibrant and do yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, we have to live in the moment. We have to live, I believe, urgently. Mm. Not neurotically, not anxiously, but a sense of like, now is great. Yeah. And if it's not, what do I have to do to make it better? Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, when you know what the rules are, you, you follow them. But at some point you go, maybe it's the wandering, mm -hmm. right? The wandering, just looking around the planet, meeting new people, learning new things. And you wander, then you start to wonder more because they work perfectly together. Wandering and wondering become one. And there's no doubt that you learn from that. You gain wisdom. So to me, it's this beautiful equation. The more you wander, the more you see, the more you experience. You know, you're, you're reminding me, Roger, of something that Katrina and I talk about, which is, you know, it takes courage to step outside of those lanes, as you're referring to, and, and to actually be who you are, right? And so when, when this catalyst was happening, when this transformation, the Life 180 was happening, was this also the time uh, when you wrote, your book, we're both, we loved, okay, so I just got to give this book a shout out. This is from 2009, I believe. Uh, what I Know, Uncommon Wisdom and Universal Truths from 10-year-olds and 100-year-olds, where Roger collected sayings from kids and centenarians that are really interesting. And so when we were reading through some of these, I just, the, this first one, is this first one's a 10-year-old. I can't, boy, these parents must be very proud. Here it is. It's not about whether somebody will be there for you. It's all about whether you will be there for someone else. That's a 10-year-old, cat. And then from a 100-year-old, we've got to love, respect, and develop a genuine belief in yourself before you can be there to be that for anybody else. So this was written around the time you were reprioritizing your life, right? Yeah, so our, our son was born. And as we all do, we fall madly in love, right? All of us changes inside. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, my father died when I was very young. So I always felt, you know, I didn't have those lessons passed on to me. So I thought, well, I want to do something different for my son. So one thing when he was born, I gave him a, an email address. And so anytime I had a thought about him or something I wanted to share or photos I'd take on the phone, I sent it to his email address. And part of it was honestly because what we discussed, you know, your past influences you. And I thought, well, if I die early, right, uh, I wanted to know something about me and my beliefs, and I want him to have something. So I thought, well, a digital diary 
much more likely to be around than this is a written one. Although I also write him letters and I stack them up for someday, wow. someday when he's bored. Love that. When he's bored, he'll be like, uh, you know. <laughs> throw it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, what's this? Um, and so then I thought, well, the book would be another way to do that as well. Sort of really to celebrate him, to honor him, but also to deal with my own past, right? My father dying. And so I always find that, you know, I live in this world of what can I learn from the past? And I think learning from the past is really important, but not living in the past. So I go, how do I learn from it? Even the pain, and a lot of it can be painful, right? But then how do I take that and how do I use that? How do I share that for the betterment, uh, in this case, of my son or others? So that's really was the, the origin of it. I wanted him having a legacy and a connection to me, whether it's the book, the you know, digital diary or so forth. And the wonder and the wonder uh, you wandered around and collected all these, right? And then you wondered what they would say. So you traveled quite a bit to finish the book, right? Uh, we traveled about 38,000 miles in the U.S. See, what I find interesting is not knowing. I find that the most interesting. When you don't know something, that's like where everything begins. Knowing something is actually sort of almost boring. I like the unknown. I like the possibility of life versus the probability. Now, there's certain probabilities you do want to have. Right? You want to take care of your family. You want to have a place to sleep. You want to have good food. But I like possibilities because mm-hmm. possibility means you're open and life is fluid and that you know it becomes uh, like a pinball. Yeah, game. you're discovering, you're learning. Yeah, and you're keeping the pinball in play because mm-hmm. it's not about trying to get all the points at one time. It's just about enjoying the experience and getting more points. Yeah. And if you don't, you hit the next ball out and you try it again. Yeah, so I, I'm sure you bring that into some of your filmmaking. So you're a filmmaker as well as a photographer. And you recently put together some short films for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And so do you want to talk a little bit about that? I know they integrate your amazing footage from Greenland and Iceland and Namibia. So why don't you tell about us a little bit about the artists whose music were used and those kind of things. I go to these amazing places and, and I, I'm not sure why, but I, I love to share and I love to connect. And I feel like the more that I can share and connect with people, not only, like I'm a vessel to like Mother Earth. Mm. So the more that I connect people to the planet, I always feel like if you care about something and you love something, like when you really love something, mm-hmm. you'll protect it. Mm-hmm. You'll, be, you'll be conscientious about it. You'll do things that matter. So I try to say, okay, how do I get all this amazing artwork that Mother Earth is? And I always think of myself more as a designer, like I'm in the sky and you know, you're looking down and you just want to design the picture, but Mother Earth is already the artist, right? Mm-hmm. And same with filmmaking. So like, I have all this footage and we're thinking, okay, what can we do for Earth Day? It's gonna be 50th anniversary, as you said. Uh, I always think of every day as Earth Day because as it should be. Yeah. And I said, okay, how do we do these videos? Uh, so one production company did a couple of videos for us. Uh, one with Agnes Obel, who's just exceptionally <laughs> gifted and talented. Another mm-hmm. one, and she's from Denmark. And another was a band called Health, which is from Los Angeles. Again, exceptionally talented. And Health is a heavy metal band. Mm-hmm. And you think, well, what's heavy metal and nature got to do together? But when you see it, wow. it's dramatic. Wow. It's really yeah. emotionally engaging. And then I got a call and said, look, we need a video for Herbie Hancock. Uh, and I was like, great, great. They said, oh, yeah, he's a very important client of ours, of mine. He's been with me forever. I said, okay, great. I said, it was Friday now. I said, okay, uh, we'll, we'll work on it next week. He goes, Oh, no, no, I, his birthday's on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> we need it for Sunday. I'm like, I'm like it's, it's, it's Friday at 10 o'clock. Oh, my God. So I said, well, can we please speak with him? Because uh-huh. I want to get his input. So finally at 4 o'clock, we got on the phone. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, how are we going to do this? Uh-huh. And we did it. Herbie was fantastic. Everybody donated their music. Great. So my whole feeling is that we gave it to Conservation International. And they released one every day uh, for the whole week. So that's the background. That's how it happened. And yeah, I was just going to say, and so for our audience, uh, we're going to give your contact stuff, your website and stuff uh, in a little bit. But when you see these, Katrina and I just love the marriage of a visual and music. You knew exactly what music should go with what visual. And uh, just to piggyback on something you said earlier, as far as communication is concerned, it communicates communicates volumes emotionally and so we do feel what you feel you know what i mean like you bring us along on that journey um we read a quote from a social media post of yours you said let's protect mother earth not because she needs our protection but because we need her and so do future generations so kat and i of course love this sentiment so i want to follow up 
with an observation when we were talking about you this morning. It seems like, based on what we were talking about earlier, that uh, because you're passionate about protecting and preserving the earth, uh, that it probably is coming from the fact that you had an unstable home life. And so that is fueling your passion for, hey, let's make our home stable, right? So could you expound on this idea that we should protect the earth, not because she needs us, but because we need her? Well, first of all, please send me an invoice for that insight because you're, I think you're actually right. No, I think it is right because, you know, no one was protecting me when I grew up. And I'm a big believer that you help and you reach out, not because you're asked, but because it's the right thing to go do. And I look at Mother Earth, and it's a big rock, right? That rock exists with or without us. Yes, That's my belief. Absolutely. Okay. And she creates because she creates. She doesn't create for us, per se. She creates. And we're the fortunate recipients mm -hmm. on a range of levels, you know, spiritual, religious, physical, emotional, psychological, practical. But she exists. Mm -hmm. So my point is, we don't need to save the planet. 4.5 <laughs> billion years, I think the track record's yeah. there. <laughs> They're gonna right? be, the planet's gonna be okay. The question is, do we? Mm -hmm. And so we talked about family, right? And we have to live and think beyond ourselves. And it's hard to do that. It really is. But, you know, it's, it's like, you know, literally, so on the way over, you'll be glad to know I took a shower. And uh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It's once a week. It just happened to be Tuesday. Nice. And, but, you know, when I take a shower after I get out, be perfectly clear about this. I always think of something one person taught me, which was takes military showers, right? Which is oh. two minutes or less. Yeah. It's the notion of would I love to take a 10 or 20 minute shower? Yes. But I also realize it's it's not water, it's a gift, mm. right? And when you're given a gift, you don't get greedy. Mm. You, you get appreciative. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean I'm, I'm perfect by any means. I just I try to be conscious and conscientious. So I just think Mother Earth is going to be here with or without us. And the question is if we want to be with her, mm -hmm. not just for ourselves, but for everybody, how do we do it in the most he healthy and respectful way? You know, it's interesting because this whole quarantine that we've all been yeah. through, you know, definitely, I, you definitely see the nature bouncing back. I'm like, this is so obvious. We're, we're still living here, but we're treading a little lighter. Um, and when we tread a little lighter, it's amazing how things come mm. back so fast. And we were noticing parks were, were um, chain linked off and there were so many squirrels. Yeah. Like, I mean, they were just hundreds of them taking over this strip of land. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> everything's coming out because we're not all everywhere, yeah. you know? It's amazing. So I thought I felt like that was a really, you know, just kind of right in my face of like how Mother Earth, you know, yeah. powerful, isn't it? Yeah. I and mean, you think about it, we, we've the roles have been switched. You know, we put animals into zoos, right? But the pandemic has turned us into living in zoos, <laughs> like in the cages, in right? The, yeah. And so we're looking out, wondering if it's safe out there. Mm -hmm. But guess what? For the rest of the planet Earth, mm -hmm. it's completely safe, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which is quite remarkable. It's safer yeah. almost without yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. yeah. So, you know, just thinking 100 plus years, we've gone from like a billion people to 8 billion people. And, and not much more than 100 years we went from no indoor plumbing to indoor plumbing to no air conditioning to air conditioning to no planes to planes. And, you start, and all of a sudden you start to see everything just lift off in terms of consumption. Mm -hmm. And some consumption is inevitable. Some is healthy. Uh, and some becomes detrimental to, to us. Mm -hmm. So that's what I meant by, you know, Mother Earth is going to be good with or without us, right. but we may not be. And, you know, Kat, do you think, too, like to Roger's point, that like when you take a shorter shower, you're thinking about other people. You're not, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you said, we're not just consuming, consuming. We're thinking, and you've seen, and your husband, and you have seen, traveling, and you go, wow, this country has no water. We have no, we're, right. it's all, and you carry it for miles on a bucket on your head. So then you go, and I'm going to go home and take a, a three hour shower. I don't think so. Right. That's so true. And, and, you know, and, and so just to follow up with some of that, um, you've said that we are strongest when we see how together we are. And when we see how connected we are to each other, to nature and all living things, as we're talking about. And what does that mean to you, especially in a world where people are, they're divided right now, they're disconnected. We're trying to find some common ground, whether you know you know try to kind of push the politics aside and and just know that you know art can communicate things and so how does your art communicate that idea of us being connected and help bridge that divide 
That's a great question. I, I don't know that it bridges a divide, I'll be honest. I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's a, such a person-by-person yeah. person point. Yeah. You know, I'm just trying to show that beauty exists. Yeah. That is beyond our ability to create or comprehend sometimes until we see it or experience it. Mm-hmm. And then you have to say, okay, what does that mean to me? And each person has to decide. You know, when I, I was in Namibia literally right before the pandemic broke. I got back, I think it was March 9th or 10th. And when I was there, you know, there, it felt to me as if things were coming full circle for me. And that's what I mean by that is when I was there, most people f- photograph you know, the mountains and the landscapes. And they're big and they're strong and they're rugged. And I thought, well, back to our earlier t- points, right? That's what we're supposed to be, mm-hmm. right? And, but what made me fall deeply in love with Namibia, in addition to the people, was that there was sand everywhere. And I, I felt deeply, I thought, oh, you know, we all become speck of sand. We think we're the mountain, mm-hmm. but the mountain's made up of sand, mm-hmm. just in a different form, right? Yeah. But each of us, over time, through weather, you know, storms, wind, water, right? We get worn out and worn down, and we come back to the bare essence of what we are, which is we're all specks of sand. Mm-hmm. Now, if I put a speck of sand down right here, it would be inconsequential. You may not even recognize it. But when I was in Namibia, what I saw, and these amazing, amazing designs, I mean, that words can't describe, and this architecture and this construction of beautiful, beautiful art. But it wasn't because they were individual specks of sand. It was because there were trillions upon trillions upon trillions that had been blown together, shaped together. So not only were they more beautiful together, they were stronger together. And I thought, that's the essence of all this. We're told to be this. At the core, our fear is that we are the speck. But the truth is, it's the speck together is where we want to be. Because that is more beautiful than it is more strong and becomes insurmountable. You you can't run into a sand dune and get expected to move. It doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. But you can step on a speck of sand. So to me, it's that whole notion of uh, letting go of self-importance, right, truly, and just saying, okay, how am I here to serve others, serve myself? And what's my role in, in, in bridging that? Mm-hmm. And so that to me is what it's all about. And that's where I think if people, if we can let go of our, our, our deep-seated fear that we don't count, right, that we don't matter. I need to be seen. I need yeah. to be important. Yeah. And the truth is you are when you're together. Mm-hmm. Not when you're fighting. You're actually important when you're yourself together. And that sacrifice or whatever it takes to, to right. be together and to see the other person's point of view yeah, and to absolutely. try to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Right. Soothing and connecting and inspiring. See, that is exactly, see, you were saying you're not sure you're making those kind of bridges. I totally see you doing that, certainly with your insights. Uh, I was just thinking about the whole iceberg thing. The majority of what we go through, what we're experiencing in life is below the surface. Mm-hmm. The majority of life, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you've stated, okay, that... It, intention you've actually say, said that on your website as well and one manifestation of connecting soothing inspiring uh was when we saw this was a clip from i think we just played it uh from 2016 when you would go to cedar sinai hospital in la to visit and you would take them on virtual journeys and cat as you were saying nowadays that's such a thing so many people cannot get out of their house let alone imagine going you know traveling, sight, traveling on a, everywhere on a flight so no. you were able to take people on virtual journeys in their hospital beds could you just tell us a little bit more about that it's always back to how do you serve right and how do you give back and how do you take what you're doing which may be very important to me and but how do you make it have a, even a higher purpose so I just felt like it was important for me to give my time. Uh, I know people have been in hospitals and some people have never gotten out of them. And uh, it's scary in there. Mm-hmm. Not because the, the people who work there aren't great, they are. But when you're out of your home, out of your comfort zone, uh, it is often a, a tenuous situation. So I just thought, how do I go in for people uh, who are need a distraction and say to them, Okay, today I would introduce myself, and I do want to give special credit to Cedars. They're phenomenal. I mean, I know a lot of hospitals are phenomenal, but they have an amazing volunteer program. Yeah. So I put on my little jacket, <laughs> you know, all dressed properly, white sneakers, uh, and I would just go in and I'd introduce myself. They knew I would be coming, and I said, like, 
where in the world would you like to travel today? Would you like to go to Africa? Would you like to go to Antarctica? Would you like to be with polar bears? Would you like to be with cheetah? Would you like to see penguins? Where would you like to go? And you know, it ended up being one of two things. It would either they be very interested in that, or they use that, which is the whole purpose, as a bridge to talk about what was on their mind. So to me, my photographs, truthfully, were unimportant. I, I was trying to be a, a bridge or a vessel to them to either have a distraction, right, or allow them to share something that was important to them in that time, which sometimes you need a stranger for. That's so unique. Were you the first person ever to do that at Cedars or at the hospital? It sounded like a pretty unique idea. They do a lot there, first they of do. all. It's an amazing, amazing, wow. amazing program. Uh, I, I think this was the first with photography. Uh huh. So in that regards, I believe it was. Uh, and, you know, the people who I dealt with seemed to very, very much appreciate it. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, so we, and then, you know, there's sometimes, like, even on Christmas Day, you know, a lot of people can't get to see people in the hospital. And so I'd say, okay, who's, who's available? Who wants to see someone? Wow. And, you know, I, I really do believe this. The more that you give, uh, you get back so much more. I mean, the truth is, it's always the case. Mm-hmm. And I always find, like, my life improves when I give more. Mm-hmm. Not with an expectation I'll get anything back. Right. It's just that experience. Because, truthfully, you feel good about yourself. You feel like, you know, this is a life that's worth living. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you find out somehow, co- through karma, right, that the universe rewards you. And I think part of that's a mindset, not let's say a practical reward. Right. But you so start to mindset. feel better about how things are and can be. And it goes back to possibilities. And I, I actually think there's now science behind all of that. They've done studies. And definitely when you do things for other people, you actually get much more of a happiness boost than yeah. when you're trying to do something for yourself. Really, giving is has been kind of scientifically proven that it's it's better than receiving <laughs> because it really does you you feel that impact and it's more uh, it's more long lasting. And to your point, giving is actually really easy. It can be a smile. You know, you smiled, and that's a gift. You know, you open the door for somebody. You know, my son. We were we were taking a hike about a year ago, and this has always been the case. And he's very warm. He's very friendly. But whenever we're hiking, if I was in the front, right, people would walk by, go, "Hey, how you doing?" And you know, at one point, he said, like, Dad, you don't know any of these people. <laughs> I go, not yet. Not yet. And he, I said, but isn't it much more fun to smile and be kind and say hello and then they say hello back? And why not just, it's like a boost. Why not? Yeah. I know our kids are like, you're embarrassing us. Quit saying hi to strangers. What are you doing? Right. But what you find is, but that's a gift. Like, and they're giving you a gift when they respond back. Yes. And so that's what I love. I love like a smile. I love a moment of kindness. I love those little touches. It doesn't have to be big. And what I love about that too is you're demonstrating something for your son. You're saying, be in that posture of looking to give a smile, looking to, to contribute that way. I see that in my son now. So much so that my wife laughs because she goes, oh my gosh, he's a mini you. He is. Your son is a mini because you. Because oh we gosh. love. So cute. But the same thing, Roger. I feel like in a way, I'm not completely, Kat, I don't know if you think this way as a parent. I'm a little self-conscious. Like I know he's watching. So I'm going to, sh- dem- and it's also in me to do. But do you feel like that as a dad? No, it's definitely in me. And I also do feel like as a role model, you want to make sure that you're, you're exhibiting the behavior that you would like him to at least learn from. Yeah. And do it his own way. Right? So no, absolutely. Look, I find like most people, I've traveled the world. I know we've all traveled the world. And that's an incredible privilege. I find like 99% of the people have been amazingly kind. Yeah, I think so. And I think that sometimes we can get caught up in like the negative news that's out there because people are trying to put out positive news as well. I mean, it's not just negative people. are, And I think in this day and age, people are realizing how important, like, just please, not let's not all focus on the negative. But when we do, you know, try to, you know, change the story, reframe it and focus on some positive things that are going on, you find out that actually it's everywhere. And that really the negative is the exception, I really believe. And, and that's why everyone needs to kind of work for unity instead of the division with us because it's like creating negative instead of don't you understand that people really are inherently wanting to do the right thing they really want to love other people and be there I really do believe that and um, I wanted to say something else I feel like you probably have done maybe to teach your son or to show this example and it's unique is that you don't always wait for people to reach out to you that you you will reach out to like you're saying and that in with your photography you offered your photography and films to the academia in an effort to assist them in their research and the kind of research you do and um, you reached out to work with 
places like UCLA. Oh, my alma mater. Okay, yes. Jefferson's alma mater, Columbia, Brown University, which is my alma mater, and um, Army Corps of Engineers and others. So one interesting story you connected with was with Ben Weiss of MIT, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, you know, when I first came back from Greenland, just in my first trip, I thought, well, I've got all this like amazing photography and film work. Who else can use it? And then I started Google searching Greenland and scientists, and I found all these names. And I just started writing people. That's amazing. That's and, really cool. and and my feeling was, if they don't respond, that's okay. I'll try again, because I always think a lack of a response or a no is just the beginning of a dialogue, <laughs> right? That's right. I, that's and, what I tell my kids. Yes. Yeah. And so all these people, like Larry Smith, who was at UCLA, is now at Brown. Lincoln Pitcher, who's at UCLA. All these different people. Adam LeWinter, who I'm working with, who's part of the Army Corps of Engineers. All of these people. Uh, I just reached out to Kristen Ponar, University of Buffalo. But as I write to Ben Weiss, what happened, I was in Nook uh, in Greenland, the capital. So Greenland's got 56,000 people, 15,000 people live in the capital. And uh, I was in the hotel and I saw those people talking. And then later on, I saw the same group having coffee. Okay. So then I was having coffee and I was actually waiting for my coffee. And this gentleman walks by. And I look at him and I go, Hey, <laughs> where are you from? He looks at me, he's like, Boston. I go, Boston, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> he's like, I'm, I'm studying the Isua Greenstone Belt and the electromagnetic field, and when it turned on, I'm playing Earth. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did he just say? And then he goes, look, uh, where are you from? I said, Los Angeles. He goes, what are you doing here? And I went, click, <laughs> click. He's, he's like, what? I go, you're studying the universe, and I click. Um, so, <laughs> so we started to talk, and he said, oh, you yeah, were trying to fly out to Isoa to study it, um, and to literally see when the electromagnetic field of planet Earth turned on. I'm thinking, I still don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so they finally, he finally took off, and I started researching, and I was like, oh. So he runs planetary sciences at MIT. So I go back to the hotel, and there's eight of them with all their bags out, you know, duffel bags. And he's like, hey, how you doing? I said, good. I said, so you guys are leaving? He goes, yeah, we have a window, good weather window, and we have to go out, we'll be camping. I said, can I, can I have your GPS coordinates? And him and his colleagues were like, well, why? I said, I like my coffee black. <laughs> and they're like, what? I said, I just, I'm just telling you, I like my coffee black. Can I I'm like, well, give me your GPS coordinates. Oh, they're like, gosh. okay. So I get the coordinates, I email them, text them to my, my pilot. They take off. Uh, I go see my pilot, and I says, is, is this anywhere close to where we're going? He goes, oh, yeah, it's right on the way. I said, well, <laughs> Stop. we got to pick up some chocolate for them, and then I want to get my black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. they're up there, they, and the next morning, you know, it was like, vroom, 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 for the helicopter. Here and also, you come. And they don't know I'm coming, right? And all of a sudden, I look down, and, you know, the tents are out. Super, 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 super. I mean, Greenland's remote. Okay, uh, Nook's remote, uh, where they're staying is super remote. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you can just hear the chopper, boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, I looked down. And you, may know, you may want to have this out, but of course, some of them had to go to the bathroom. And I thought, this is perfect. This is blackmail photography. <laughs> I'm like, these guys. And you're up there going, I'm click, like, click, 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 click. <laughs> and so anyhow, we land, and I get out, uh, and I walk over you know, to the tents, and they're all like, what are you doing here? I said, I told you, I like my coffee black. <laughs> and so that was the most amazing setup. Ever. I know, right? So anyhow, so Ben and I become very, very good oh, friends. Really he stays cute. with us all the time. His wife oh, Tony is amazing. Wow. She also is uh, works at MIT and is also amazingly a genius. So that's how I got to know Ben. And literally, now it's been a year and a half, and like we become very close friends. That's awesome. Uh, fun. Wow. That sounds like a lot of fun. It was uh, fun. So. Okay, another thing that you did, <laughs> my gosh, um, you like your, he likes his coffee black, black remember that. Black, okay. In 2019, you were at, because you travel all over, Cape Morris Jessup, yep. is that right? The northernmost part of Greenland. Yes. And you said maybe even on Earth, might be the Cur land wise. Land -wise. Yes. Uh, and you said that it is typically between 29 and 43 degrees there, and when you went, it was 73 degrees. This is obviously shocking to hear and what do I know I'm not a scientist but that sounds shocking so I think I will I'm guessing I was speaking for most of our audience 
when I say that we typically don't get to travel as much as you do, and we don't get to witness firsthand what's happening to the environment. So, plus there just seems to be, as we were alluding to earlier, so much misinformation out there about what's going on. So, what would you like us to know based on what you've seen? Mm -hmm. And you are here now as our scout and you're reporting back to us. What would you like us to know um, that we don't know or that we, what is something we should know? So for all the people that already are supporters of the environment and believe that we impact the environment, this isn't for them what I'm about to say, okay? So I have a, a dear friend, I'll give you an exact story, what I want people to think about. A dear friend of mine is a doctor and he has a waiting room of about 12 people. And I said to him, I said, uh, here's what I'm saying. And he said, uh, I, I don't believe in this whole human impact of climate change. There's always changes, there's winter, there's spring. I said, yeah, there's ice ages. He's like, yeah, but I don't believe it. I said, okay, so here's what I'm gonna ask you. I said, I wanna come into your office tomorrow and I'm gonna bring 10 friends. He said, okay. I said, they all smoke. They all smoke cigarettes. He goes, you can't smoke in my office. I said, well, why? It's not healthy. I said, okay. But I really want to bring 50 people in, and we're all going to bring food in. And I'm going to lock them in your waiting room. He said, what, are you out of your mind? I go, we already know the answer to that. Let's move forward. <laughs> I said, and so we're all going to eat there, and we're going to leave our trash there, and we're going to have a barbecue. We can't have a live fire. Oh, it's my story, not yours. Listen. <laughs> I said, and then this is the bad part. Everyone has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so you're going to have a smoke-filled room. You're going to have trash everywhere. And you're going to have people crapping all over your waiting room. And he's like, are you out of your mind? You're crazy. I go, now why is that not acceptable to you? but it's acceptable when we do this to planet Earth. Why is it that you think your office space is any more special and it should be any more safe than our entire planet? And he said, look, I, I get your point. I'm gonna have to think about it. And he's like, I probably won't change my point of view. I said, I'm gonna ask you to change your point of view. I'm asking you to at least consider to be open. And so, I don't believe we have to convert the people who are already believers, but we have to just be open mm -hmm. and give people a way to understand. We can't fight them, we can't argue with them. They're our family, they're our friends, they're our neighbors, they're the world. And we have what we have, eight billion people. So now the question is, how do we get people to connect mm -hmm. themselves to reality and the impact of what they do? So that's what I try to share with people, mm -hmm. is if you wouldn't do that in your car, you wouldn't do that in your home, you wouldn't do that in your office, why do you do it to the planet? Mm -hmm. It's all the same. Yeah, that really is like, you know, the big picture and kind of great analogy to kind of bring it home to make us understand that. And and I know for you, you know, you are such a family man and you had said that there's nothing more fulfilling than hanging out with your wife and son. And, you know, we want to preserve this earth for future generations and everyone. And we're taking time nowadays to reflect and recognize what's truly important and with our family. And with that in mind, how important is it to you? Is it to pass on your passions and perspectives to your son? It's a great question. Uh, to me, pass, my passions, I don't need to pass on. To me, it's about laying a foundation uh, a principles, a framework where he gets to live his life and my job is to enable him to be his best self with context. He wants to be an athlete, great. He doesn't want to be great. I just want him to have a foundation so he is enabled. Because mm -hmm. I think as a parent, you have a job. You either disable mm -hmm. or you enable, mm -hmm. right? And so how you treat them, what you say to them, right? How you engage, all of that matters. Mm -hmm. And so... I want him to find whatever his passion is, create his passion to explore. You know, it took me a long time, and I am old. It took me a long time to get where I am, I'm serious. And part of it was seeking, creating, considering possibilities, not, knowing, not seeking an answer, but wanting to create a sense of true fulfillment that was spiritual, that was emotionally and psychologically satisfying, creatively rewarding. Uh, so I want him just to be him. 
and my job is I think is to give him that support, provide direction, but I, I'm not going to tell him what to pursue. That's great though, that's but beautiful. he, you, you kind of, you're, it's through your example, really. Well, all he sees with me is gray hair now. That's like, Dad, you're old and you got gray hair. And you say hi to every stranger we meet. <laughs> yes. uh, so one thing that Katrina and I are always looking for is practical information that we can pass on to our crazy, amazing humans tribe. You know, to, so we can all make our lives a little bit better. We read with interest your blog post about the 10% rule. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, because I thought, yeah, because we look at the improvements we want to make to the earth or the universe and even to ourselves and it looks like huge mountains right but you make the 10 percent rule really easy to kind of apply right away so could you just talk a little bit about that sure and i always think it's about uh, refinement because refinement's improvement and i know that whenever i try to take on too big of a task it can be overwhelming like i'm setting myself up right not to be successful or not to enjoy the journey in the process so by the time I get to the outcome, I'm like, I'm just happy it's over, right? Because <laughs> right? you're miserable all along the way. Right. And the outcome is rarely worth it, right? So I just think, if you say, how do I do anything, anything differently, better, or worse, just 10%, mm -hmm. it's like saving money. 10%, truthfully, is often not very much. Being 10% nicer, what does that mean? Like an extra smile a day, right? So it's finding the little things that you can do to give to others that also give to yourself. So that's what I always say to my son. It's like, it's about those incremental steps that over time will add up. Mm. Don't always wait for the big quantum leap yeah. because you, you're creating your own expectation and possibly your own disappointment. Absolutely. What do we always say at the end of every episode? Look for one thing you can do. Just one thing to do every week. And it doesn't mean that everything's perfect, right? It doesn't mean that you get everything you want. It just means, you know what? It's kind. And it's, and it's something that's, gentle, soothing, supportive, and loving. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way we are going to come together as a community, yeah. you know, as, as the sand brought yeah. together and create mountains, right? And good mountains. But, um, you know, I thought we would close out this interview with your blog post that you entitled, It Is Not Enough. And uh, we printed it out and put it in front of you. And when you looked at that, when we sat down, you said, did I write this? And we're like, yes, you did. And we thought it was beautiful and we'd love it if you would read that for sure. our audience. Um, it is not enough to take care of oneself. It is not enough to take care of one's immediate family. It is not enough to voice frustration about the world we live in. It is not enough to complain about the politicians, corporations, and natural human instincts. Rather, it is enough to believe and practice active human kindness and active caring. Rather, it is enough to keep facing into the wind when our backs are better suited to block the storm of indifference and anger. Rather, it is enough to get outside of ourselves in our lives to know that truly understanding and helping others is the genuine path for us and all living species and is in our own self-interest. It is not enough or rather, it is both. Together as we should be, for together is enough. For together yeah. is enough. That is, that is beautiful. So how, can our, okay, so how can our audience connect with you and see you know, what adventures you're on and, and uh, you know, know more about your short films and your photography and just follow you? That's easy. But the more important piece is that they should feel comfortable writing me awesome. as well. Okay. So I obviously have a website. Uh, I know you guys are going to post it. I have Instagram. But I think everybody, if they have questions or comments or thoughts, they should reach out to me. In fact, I, I did a video yesterday that I posted asking people to give me their thoughts and feedbacks about my art, my work, and what it means to them, mm -hmm. what it, it makes them feel. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage you know, your listeners and your fans and your friends to say, I have a question for them. I'm going to reach out. I'll respond. That's awesome. Because that's about the right. connection, right? Right. You bet. So, And just to say it on, so for our listeners, rogerfishman.com is your website. Yes. And, and we will have a link on right. our website for Crazy okay. Amazing. And you're on Instagram too, right? Yes. Yeah, Instagram. You yep. have Facebook. I follow yes. you on Facebook as well. Right. Well, we love you. So there you have it. You know, definitely follow Roger on Instagram, go to his website, check out all of his beautiful and inspiring films and photography, as well as your insights and wisdom that you have shared with us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Both Thank of you, you for being Appreciate here, it. sharing your heart and making, you know, like how you make the world a better place just by being in it and the things you do. Thank you for doing that. And you are indeed a crazy, amazing human. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.
Well, that was great. And we wanted to give a shout out and share some thoughts and comments from our Crazy Amazing Human podcast listeners. Thank you to our subscriber, Patty, in Los Angeles. She wrote us after listening to our episode featuring Taps Mugadza, a wonderful musician and creator of the organization Taps for Africa. And she wrote, Taps Mugadza was amazing. I really felt the depth of sharing and embracing his life story was a profound experience for me. And his gift of words, song, and music deeply touched me. You and Jefferson are an incredible team, and your skills at interviewing and participating make this a 10. XO Patty. Oh, Patty. That was really nice. Thanks, so Patty. So sweet. Do I owe you money? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Patty. Okay, here's a note from listener Kristen in Colorado. Uh, dear Katrina and Jefferson, I just watched your podcast with the gentleman from The Giving Spirit. All right, Tom Begamani. Yeah. I loved how you both gave him a lot of time to tell his story. I was especially captivated with his stories about his childhood growing up in Arlington with immigrant parents from India, right? Mm -hmm. I thought his advice to people on how to get involved with homeless initiatives was great. It was great. It, was. it sounds like he does a great job educating people as to what's going on with the homeless. I liked the discussion at the beginning of your segment about habits <laughs> create friction. That, I, I'm still using right? that. Yes, me I too. Am. Something good to think about. Keep on keeping on. Love, Kristen. That's so nice. So appreciate the kind words, Kristen, right, in so, Colorado. Right. So awesome. So mm -hmm. if you'd like to correspond with us, please make sure and go to our website, crazyamazinghumans.com, where you can get our email address. Send us your thoughts, comments, and questions. We love hearing from you. Yes, we do. We definitely do. We read everything you write to us. So thank you. And that's our podcast. We want to thank Roger Fishman for being with us today and sharing his heart, his wisdom, his passion for both humanity and the environment. If you've enjoyed today's show and you think it would be meaningful for someone you know, please be a crazy, amazing human and let them know about us. A couple of quick reminders. Make sure to subscribe to the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We've also filmed the podcast, yeah. so you can check us out on the Crazy Amazing Humans YouTube channel. And make sure and leave comments. Like we just said, we love to hear what you're thinking. That's true. And most of all, we just want to thank you for being with thank us today. You. Remember that every little kindness has the potential to create crazy, amazing human experiences one person at a time. Right. So this week... We want to encourage you to find one thing that you can do to extend kindness and love in the world. My name is Jefferson Denham. And I'm Katrina Carlson. See you next time right here on the Crazy Amazing Humans podcast. Something crazy, crazy amazing.